and we'll share my screen. All right. Perfect. Um, so if any of you have questions throughout the presentation, you are welcome to unmute your mic. Um, you're also welcome to utilize the chat window. Um, I will try to keep an eye on it um, as best as possible. Um, so just to introduce myself, my name is Kate Heron, um, and I have the pleasure of being the career liaison to the College of Communication and Information. And I am joined uh, by Ms. Jennifer Kikellis. Um, Jennifer, if you'd like to say hi. I think, I think, I think you're muted. I still can't hear you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Can anybody else hear Jennifer? Is that just me? Can somebody put in the chat window? Yeah, okay, Karina can't hear either. That's okay. We're going to figure it out. Love technology. It's totally fine. We're just going to roll with it. Um, but the amazing Jennifer Kakelis is here <laughs> and she will have the opportunity to speak with you all a little bit later and also give you some, some best practices. So we will go ahead um, and get started. Um, so the things that we are going to discuss today would be um, really concentrating on those application materials for graduate um, for applying to graduate school for for communication science and disorders. So we'll talk a little bit about um, the resume, about the um, the personal statement, um, the GRE uh, letters asking for letters of recommendation, um, and then there will be a Q and A with Jennifer Kakelis and then just any kind of general questions. So that is the agenda for what we will be um, discussing this afternoon. So we're gonna start off with resumes. So for a lot of us, when we're applying um, to graduate school, that resume is gonna be one of the things that the, uh, that the graduate committee is really gonna take a look at it. And it's not just assessing um, the structure of it, which is of course important and we'll go over best practices for that, but it's also looking at the content that you put into it and how much you are able um, to really articulate, not generally, but specifically what it is that you have engaged in in terms of your academic and professional careers. Can you hear me now? Yes. Awesome. Perfect, wonderful. Um, okay, so we're gonna start off um, with general best practices for resumes. So one of the first things is that it has to look good. So rightly or wrongly, that if I were to hold a resume up here or back here rather, that even if you couldn't read the content of it, it has to look good. And by that, you know, the ways to do that would be that it has clean and consistent formatting. So that if there's a 12 point space in between sections that you then don't put a 16 space um, into the next section, right? The next thing is that there should be really no hyperlinks. Um, hyperlinks would be for your email address. If you have a LinkedIn account, um, those would be generally the only uh, hyperlinks that would appear on a resume. Um, if those are on your resume, please remove a hyperlink. Um, inevitably when they are printed, um, they turn out to be a light gray. Um, and also it just, it's in blue font. It's just, it's not good. Um, spell out acronyms. So if you have an associate's degree, spell out AA. Um, certainly your Bachelor of Science degree, spell out Bachelor of Science, spell out communication, science and disorders. So it is not BS in CSD, it is Bachelor of Science in communication, science and disorders. Thorough quantified bullet points. So the content, um, all of the bullet points that are on your resume really should be between one to two full lines long. So anywhere between one full line to two full lines. Um, and that they would each start off with an action verb um, and that they are thorough, specific, and quantified. By quantified, I mean the approximate number of people, workshops, teaching tools, dollars, percentages um, that is specific to each of those bullet points. Please also know what your major is. So communication, science, and disorders. Um, something has happened in the last maybe two weeks where I've received a lot of resumes from CSD students, which I love, um, but I've also seen probably seven different versions of, of the degree. Um, it is not communication science. It is not science and disorders. It is not communication disorders. It is not disorders of communication. 
Um, so please make sure that you um, know what your major is and then spell out the full acronym. So unlike everything that you have been trained on for gosh, 10, 15 years now in terms of writing. So one inch margins, 12 point font, double space, no bold, no italics, really all of those general best practices for writing go out the window. So you can insert a little bit of bold, some italics and regular font into your resume. And then you can even play around some with font size. So typically your name should be the biggest thing on your resume. So around 24 point font. Your contact information can be around 14 point font. And the body of your resume needs to be readable. So somewhere between 11 to 12 point font. Personally, I think 11.5 is the sweet spot. I had um, a student who was not a CSD student, but this was a while ago, um, who it, it had been drilled into her for so long that she needed a one page resume and only a one page resume. And, uh, but she had so much content. And so she put everything in nine point font. That was way too small. Um, if we were an employer or a graduate school committee, I, I'm not convinced that they're gonna really um, look at nine point font if they have to rummage through their drawers and find their, uh, find their glasses, right? So please make sure that it is readable. So we're going to do a deep dive into an example of a real life um, CSD res uh, resume. All of the um, identifying information has been taken out. Um, this is not to say that your resume has to look exactly like this one. It also does not mean that your experience needs to look exactly like this one. In fact, it probably won't. So I only want you to look at this example in terms of a foundation for when you are crafting or editing your own resume. So to start with on most resumes, well, on all resumes, we would start with the name and the contact information. It is just your name, your email address and your phone number. At this point, um, most um, organizations, most um, institutions are going to email you or call you um, instead of sending you things through the US Postal Service. Um, and then also for safety reasons, um, I definitely suggest removing that physical address. So it is your name, first and last in nice big font, about 24 point font, your contact information, email and phone number. Uh, we had a question come through. Do you recommend us keeping the resume to one page only? And I would definitely suggest that you were paying attention when you're applying to graduate school, if they have any um, restrictions. You know, for a lot of CSD majors, um, they, they have so much experience that it spills onto the second page. And in general, I think that that can be okay. However, know that a, that a um, graduate committee, we always want everybody to look at our resume with a fine tooth comb, right? Um, but they're going to be looking at hundreds of applications. So we wanna put the emphasis, the things that we really, really, really want that graduate committee to, to look at, to absorb, to walk away and be like, oh, that's what that student did, right? And I'm really excited about that on that first page and even in the top half of the first page. So whether there is a second page or not, that could be okay, right? You really want to emphasize that all of the content that you are adamant that they read, that they take in is on that first page, specifically that top half. So that next thing that would be on your resume would likely be education. So for education, it would be uh, Florida State University. So the full, not FSU, Florida State University, Tallahassee, Florida. And then it would be the date that you graduate, the anticipated date of graduation. So for this student, they graduated in May of 2020. Then it would be your degree, Bachelor of Science in Communication Science and Disorders. You could, if you were doing the interdisciplinary certificate, that could be there. It could be under a separate section for certifications. And that's, that's okay. But it's more that that degree needs to be top and center under education, if you're pursuing a minor, and then the GPA. So this is not to say that this is the end all be all, it has to look exactly like this. But in terms of content, it is the institution, city and state, month and year of graduation, and your degree. And you can see that we have a mixture of italics right here, and bold and regular font. For some of you all, you are pursuing um, research opportunities, which is very exciting. So you can see that we're again, we're following the same format, right? So we have a mixture of bold, 
we have italics, we have regular font, and that, that category is in uh, caps. So just like education was in caps, so is research. Then we dive into bullet points. For bullet points, you can see that all of these start off with an action verb that's in first person implied perspective. So first person implied perspective is something like conducted or wrote. First person perspective is I conducted, I wrote. So we want to make sure it is an implied perspective. The word I should not appear in your resume. These bullet points are between one to two full lines long, right? Not, they are not in paragraph form, they are in bulleted form. And that is because it is a lot easier for a graduate committee, a hiring committee to look at your resume and look at bullet points. It is so much easier for them to absorb that content if it's in bulleted form. Would I put the minor before the, certifi uh, the certificate? Um, I, don't, I don't know that you can go wrong. I personally would probably put the certificate first um, before the minor, but I don't think that's a make or break. I would definitely put your major first though, without a doubt. That was a question in the chat window. <clears throat> so if we move on um, to leadership and campus involvement, so I've had the pleasure of the last, gosh, four years looking at so many CSD resumes, and I'm always incredibly impressed by all of the amazing things that you all are doing in terms of that campus and community involvement. Um, CSD majors, I think, really um, set the bar pretty high for, for all of our students for that. So if you all don't have this experience, again, that is okay. It is more just to show you um, that general format. So for leadership, if you, if you are part of an organization and you hold a leadership position within that student organization, I would tend to put that above general campus involvement, just because again, we wanna emphasize the things that we're really proud of, that were the most impactful, that really set us apart in that top half of the first page of the resume. So again, you can see that there are bullet points, they are thorough, um, they are between one um, to two full lines long. Now for this particular resume, I think that this student did a tremendous job with that, um, that structure and that content. One of the things that I would have loved to see the student um, inject more of would be the quantifying. So for example, if we have organized and led a group of students, fabulous, right? Compared though to organize and let a group of 10 students or organized a team of five fundraisers. And basically what that means is that it gives you a little bit more, gosh, no credibility is the right word, but when you're looking at so many different resumes, then if we have one person where that, those numbers are a little bit higher, um, it also shows that they took that time to put in those approximate numbers um, and it sets you apart a little bit. And again, those dates are all the way moved to the right-hand side. Um, so that is to eat up um, that negative space um, that otherwise it would just be basically a column of, of um, white space on the right-hand side. And then if you have any professional experience, again, you can say that there's a mixture of bold, italics, regular font, um, bullet points. If you've observed any speech language pathologists, same thing with volunteer experience. Um, you can put the hours, uh, the approximate number of hours that you participated um, in any of those uh, experiences right there. And so that when you put the resume all together, that it looks something like this. So even if you scoot your chair away from your computer right now, that you can see that it has consistent spacing. It has consistent font sizes that the, um, the category headers like education, research, et cetera, are all in caps, that all of the content is in bullet points, that all of the dates are flush right. So all of those, the, and that's not even the content, right? That the structure is very clean and very easy to read. Because again, think about how long a graduate committee or anybody is going to spend really absorbing and looking at your resume. Um, if you held multiple leadership positions in one organization, should you break it up or organize it by the time of membership? Um, if you had multiple leadership positions in one organization, should you break it up or organize by the time of membership? Um, I would list the leadership positions in um, reverse chronological order. So this is true. I'm so glad that you brought this up. 
So for any of your experiences that are under the same category, so if you had like multiple research um, experiences or you had multiple leadership experiences, then we would list those in reverse chronological order. And that means that we list them from the most recent to the least recent by start date. Most recent to least recent by start date. And that is throughout. Um, and that is again for that consistency sake. Should you include awards, recognitions, and skills certifications? Uh, yes, absolutely. So this particular student didn't, but that does not mean that your resume would not have an award section um, or a skills section. I tend to put those on uh, like toward the end of the resume only because um, some of those awards, perhaps some of those skill sets are incredibly important and needed, but your, um, your colleagues might have similar skill sets because you all are in a similar um, field. Um, and those skill sets also might be identified within like a research section, right? So if you put a skill section at the bottom, that's totally fine, but it might um, have already been mentioned earlier um, in the resume. Uh, if I'm going to be a TA next semester, but grad school applications are due beforehand, should I include that in the resume? So my general opinion is that if you, if it is signed, sale, delivered, you know that you will be a TA, you know you'll be a leader in that organization, you know you'll be engaging in whatever that experiential learning opportunity is. Um, it's just the start date hasn't happened yet, um, but it's, it's going to happen. I would go ahead and put that on your resume. Um, that would say something like January 2020 through, I'm sorry, January 2021 through May 2021, and then still put in a couple of bullet points of what you anticipate um, will be some of your um, tasks as part of that. How would you add in things that got canceled due to COVID? <laughs> yes, a uh, very, very good question. Um, so we have, um, I'm happy to send this example. Um, so if we're looking at, um, all right, I'm gonna I'm use this one just for example's sake. That if we had summer on pediatric comma Tallahassee, Florida, that we would not include ours. And then we would um, put in like volunteer and we would not have any bullet points. And for dates, we might put something like cancel due to COVID-19. The reason that we can still include things um, that were canceled because of the pandemic because is because that it proves to that hiring committee, to that graduate committee, that you went through that application process, that you were selected, you had planned on it, you know that that was a part of your professional experience that would set you apart, um, but something completely outside of your control made that experience not come to fruition. And so that is why you can still put things um, that were canceled due to COVID-19 or impacted due to the pandemic on your resume. It's just that it still needs to follow the same format as the rest of the content. Where would you suggest the best section um, is, is to put um, being a TA under? Um, so, so that's a great question. You know, there's nothing, there's so few things where it's like this experience needs to live here. I think what I see a lot for TA positions that uh, they live under, uh, they live either under professional experience or under leadership. And kind of just depending on your resume, uh, based off of the whole resume, it depends on where um, you think it should live. Um, but those are the two places that I see it most often. Um, can we put in bullet points that we would have done um, if it was canceled due to COVID-19? Um, I would venture to say no, because that would imply at first glance that you actually did engage in that experiential learning opportunity. And we are meant to showcase that we didn't, um, and we're not trying to say that at all that we did, but that it was canceled due to COVID-19. So I would, I would, um, what you could put in if that, if you were going to put in bullet points was, um, something to the effect of, and this is super rough, um, even though this experience was canceled due to COVID-19, I conducted an informational interview with two speech language pathologists at this organization. I um, read the dissertation of, or the, read the research of this particular provider, right? So you could put in those bullet points, um, but you would not put in bullet points of what you theoretically would have done. 
How should we include any forthcoming publications? Can I include the journal if it has not been published yet? Um, I guess I would say that if, if you know that it will be published, um, if you absolutely have that information that you could put that in again, because you know some things might happen in the spring, but you're applying in November or December to graduate school. So you still wanna include that, right? To set yourself apart, to showcase the breadth of your professional experience. Um, so I guess I would I would err on, on including it. If, and this is only if you know it's absolutely going to happen. Where would you place study abroad experience? Personally, I would put that under a campus and community involvement section um, because the London program is canceled due to COVID-19 and I'm not sure if I should include that. Sure. So again, I would probably put that under campus and community involvement, but again, it would be canceled due to COVID-19. Y'all had great questions. <laughs> okay. Um, so just in the interest of time, we are going to move forward um, to talk a little bit about personal statements. Um, so personal statements are absolutely going to be taken into consideration um, for a lot of graduate schools that you might be applying to. So general best practices is that, again, it has to be easy to read. So nothing um, smaller than 11 point font, probably nothing larger than 12 point font, because again, you want to um, insert a lot of content. Um, and Definitely make sure that you are reading what it is that their page limits are, their word limits, their character limits, their character limits, including spaces are, and that you are not going above that. Um, that also does not mean that you need to go right up. So if it's 8,000 characters that you write 7,999, right? Um, it's, it's that you need to go up close to that. But really what's most important is that you're answering two specific questions. Um, a lot of institutions, and each ins institution is different, so make sure you're reading their prompt and answering their prompt. But a lot of institutions are asking two questions. Why you and why them? So why, based on your academic and pre professional experiences, should you receive one of these coveted seats in our graduate program? And why them? You all are very smart, so talented, involved in your campus and community, right? So out of all the institutions you could have applied to, why are you applying there? In terms of language, uh, make sure that in this case that it's written in first person perspective. So not first person implied, not third person, but in first person. So I, me, my. Um, no quotes, no cliches, no song lyrics. Um, I love how um, Ms. Kakelis talks about um, if, if it's a really important quote to you, and you put in your um, personal statement, it's it's probably pretty likely um, that they've already seen that amazing quote elsewhere. So you've just eaten up space in your personal statement for something that's um, probably been already used before. If I can jump in here real quick, um, I also like to uh, add on that uh, one of the main things that Ms. Heron is talking about here is the fact that uh, if you can look in this chat right now, there's 20 of us sitting in here um, you're all in the same major. Out of the 20 of you sitting here, 10 of you have a very similar experience um, with a family member, a uh, volunteer experience. It's a deeply personal issue to you. It's why you got into the field probably. My grandfather had a stroke and he had to relearn to swallow. Uh, my little brother was born with autism and, you know, or born uh, deaf and I've had to learn sign language and my family's had to adapt or I worked with a kid who had autism and seeing them have a breakthrough is, was amazing for me, that kind of thing. Very personal, very unique, very powerful stories to you. But in the field, when you have 350 applicants, 275 of those are probably going to have something extremely similar. So I know that, and I've just gotten a ton of emails about it, which is why I want to reiterate it. I know that it's extremely special to you. What I like to say is if you feel compelled to bring in that personal component, that's fine, but make it the seasoning of your personal statement and not the entree. So a little goes a long way in that, especially since you are taking up valuable space that um, you could be saying something a little bit more meaningful, a little bit more uh, grabbing for the committee. Remember also that the committee reads 
if you're looking at between our, our program alone, between main campus and distance learning, 500 letters of intent. That's exclusive of 1500 letters of recommendation. That's an awful lot of reading, right? I mean, that, that's textbooks worth of reading in a very short period of time. So make sure you're saying something that makes you very poignant, but not so maudlin or um, not very, what's the word I'm looking for here, Miss Heron? Not heartstrings, not, not um, deeply personal. Yeah. Something that's deeply personal. Am I making sense to everybody? I hope so. But just be, be mindful of it. And also be mindful because here at FSE, we have a character limit of 8,000 characters. Yes, that includes spaces and punctuation. Um, less is more. Don't feel like if they give you a three page limit, you have to fill three pages. Get it said in as, as few words as possible. Being concise is extremely important. And then with that, I will turn it back over to Ms. Aaron. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so we had a question come through the chat. So how would you suggest setting yourself apart in your personal statement? Um, one is, is uh, and it sounds like a cheap answer, <laughs> but one is answering the prompt, <laughs> um, really pointing the spotlight. And this is hard for so many of us, but pointing the spotlight on yourself. Um, so what um, Ms. Kakela said, you know, if, if it's a two page personal statement, it is not unusual. Um, in fact, very common um, for me to read one of the two pages that is about the sibling, that is about the grandparent um, that you have had an experience with that has brought you to that field. And if it's only a two page personal statement, um, I as Kate, I as a social worker, I as a mama, I want to read all about your sibling and all about your grandparent, right? Um, or about your own experience. Um, but but I, as a graduate committee, I, I really want to know about you. I, I want those, the spotlight pointed directly at you about your professional experiences, about your leadership experiences, about your research, and what you found out about how you have involved yourself in your campus and community, about how what your short and long-term goals are. Um, I am way more interested in that from, from, a, from a, um, a graduate committee perspective. I'd like to add on. Yeah. And, um, again, going back to these, these personal poignant stories, it's fantastic that you've had these experiences, um, mm -hmm. but having a personal relationship with somebody who's been impacted by a communication disorder doesn't mean you're going to be a successful student. It means that you have passion and that's great. And that's a good indicator of being successful, but it doesn't necessarily mean you are successful. So remember when you're applying to these programs, very often FSU students are in the top performers because we have such a rigorous program and our students do very well. But you're also competing against thousands of other students across the nation. Um, very oftentimes, the GPAs for those who are admitted are very, very similar. So we can read the transcripts, we can see the GPAs, we don't do GRE scores this year, but typically we do. We can see the scores, we see the objective data, we see, okay, Kate has a 3.99. Jennifer has a 3.986. Okay, well, you know, what? It, they both came through the same program. What makes me different than Kate? And mm -hmm. that's where um, elaborating a little bit on your, your resume can help you. Not, um, let me tell you all the details about my job, but if you have, I was a research assistant under Dr. Heron, that then you can talk a little bit about that research experience, but very briefly and say, okay, think about it as an interview. I don't know if anybody's going on job interviews, but think about it as a little bit of an interview where you get to really say, this is why I deserve one of your 32 spaces. There's only going to be 10 to 15% of the applicants accepted to this program. This is why I deserve one of those spots. Don't be arrogant, don't be entitled, but just say, this is what sets me apart. This is what makes me, okay, I'm a consistent, um, I, I, um, I have consistently, uh, if professionally, if I said it, I would say I've gone through professional development. I am a consistent award winner for X, Y, and Z. Um, mm -hmm. I am responsible for bringing in this brand new concept to my department. Those are the kind of quantifiable, but also qualitative aspects that you can't really convey through test scores, 
through um, GPA and through your resume. You don't have the, the, the space in, in a resume to do it. And then what you want to do is try to tie in your letters of recommendation writers to those, those parts. So if you have a research experience, um, may try to get the person who you did research with, that would be a very strong letter of recommendation to request because they'd be able to say, oh, Kate came in, she was my research, she, she did a research project with me, um, which came about because she did such a fantastic job in my class. She took initiative and she said, I want to know more about this. And so she turned it into a great um, research project, which actually helped further my research agenda. And then mm -hmm. that's going to be, that all ties together. Am I making sense, everyone on board? Okay, great. Yep, absolutely. Um, so, and, and we've covered, um, so I've covered uh, parts of this, but the prompt, um, you know, definitely make sure that you're answering the prompt for that institution. Um, but for the most part, a lot of those, uh, those prompts will be regarding why you, and those are the things that you've done inside of the classroom, but also outside of the classroom. So research, professional experiences, um, campus and community involvement, leadership, et cetera. Um, and then like we've, we've talked about, um, don't be cheesy, don't be sappy, pulling on the heartstrings. Um, again, I, I want to know, I as Kate want to know all about it, um, but from a, uh, if I'm reading hundreds of them, not so much, right? And so when I'm sent personal statements, um, I know it seems harsh, um, but that is, those are one of the first things that I um, cross off or, or trim down significantly. And then why them? Um, so why is that the institution that you're applying to? Um, and it, it can't be, um, I, I want to stay in Florida, and you are an institution in Florida, right? That might be a reason, but it needs to be more about what are their professional experiences? What is the research that you would be involved in? Who are the professors that you're really excited to learn more from, right? Specifically, what attracts you to them? And if you're applying to multiple institutions, as I'm, I'm assuming that many of you will, um, but that part in particular really needs to be institution specific. So the part about you um, still needs to be tailored, but that can have a lot of similarities um, between those personal statements you're writing, but why them needs to be specifically why that institution. And, but, uh, sorry, may I jump in there? Of course, always. Don't just regurgitate um, the facts of the institution. Don't just say, oh, I really want to come to FSU because you have an amazing autism center. And I really think that the work that, Dr., you know, and then list out all the work that Dr. Amy Weatherby or Dr. Julianne Woods does. We know who they are. We know what they do. We, we know more about them than you do. So don't really um, regurgitate those easy to read facts that basically come off of our, off of our website. We already know that. And that, again, just eats up your letter. Um, instead of saying, oh, well, Dr. Wood is just an, a, an amazing researcher and she's done so much for the field of autism, um, go ahead and say, well, I've, I am very interested in working with autistic children and I know that the experiences here at FSU could lead to um, better education and then briefly explain why. I'm not going to give you the answer. I have the answer. I'm not going to give it to you. You've got to figure that out. Hint, you're not going to pull it from our website. Some, some of these answers are in fact intrinsic value. They're not necessarily, you know, you pull them off of the website and just regurgitate the facts. Here's the other thing. These faculty members who are on the admissions committee, you're not gonna outsmart them. They've seen all these tricks. They've read the letters. In, in you gotta remember, these people have been doing this a long time. So conceivably, if somebody's been around and we have, let's say Dr. Morris, he's he's been around for, I'm not going to tell you how many years, but let's just let's just say 20 years, just for the fun of it. Let's say he served on 20 admissions committees. In 20 admissions committees, if you have 500 letters, how many how many different letters is he, has he read? You're looking at like 10,000, right? That's just for us. That's not for anything else. So they know they know what they're looking at. They know what they're looking for. They know how to cut through the BS. Don't fill it with BS. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and the last point I would add um, is think about the time that, uh, like the actual chronological time that, that a lot of folks are reading um, the applications. It might be, absolutely, it might be Tuesday at 9 a.m. when the coffee has 
really hit its peak um, after all the emails are answered at that peak time. It also could be later in the afternoon when the coffee is gone, right? So, which is why you want to cut to the chase, you want to be succinct, and you want to point the spotlight at yourself. So, humble brag. Humble brag is one of my favorite words. So, this is an awesome. Awesome. Sure. I love that. There you go. <laughs> um, so, the, uh, so the structured prompts, um, you know, are, personally, I would, I would suggest articulating and identifying one academical. So what is something that you're really interested in completing as part of your graduate program that's related to your academic goals? And then what is a professional goal? And a professional goal is not just become a speech language pathologist after graduation. Of course, that's why you're getting a graduate degree. <laughs> so it needs to be a little bit more specific. So, you know, the um, this is super rough and, and just off the cuff here, but, you know, if you're interested in working with um, um, uh, immigrant children who their first language is Spanish, um, who live in Florida, and you want to um, help provide services as a speech language pathologist for them, right? That could be an example of a professional goal. So tips for success for the personal statement, start early. Um, I think that all of us, I'm certainly guilty of this, have waited until like the night before uh, to write something, start early. Um, the reason I would mention that is that it takes some time to go through several drafts um, to, uh, and, and two tips in particular for this that I would suggest would uh, to write it down, to write, 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 write. Your job is just to write, right? And then you step away for a couple days even, like two, three days, and then you come back and you work on it again. So you come back with refreshed eyes and then you send it to people who um, will be critical, right? You know, we meet people in our lives who are like, that was amazing, that was the best personal statement that's ever been written. Um, but you also meet people in your lives that are like, this is not good. This is, this is a rough working draft. So here are some suggestions on how to make it stronger. And that takes time, which is why you should start early. Um, uh, and then revise, revise, revise. So these are some other, other tips on here, but just revise, revise, revise. And again, that's, that kind of goes hand in hand with, uh, with starting early for that. Uh, the common errors um, that I've seen, that I've, I've heard Ms. Kakelis talk about, that she's seen um, are things like, I've always wanted to be. I've always wanted to be a speech language pathologist. I've always wanted to be an audiologist. Maybe, definitely maybe, um, but maybe not. And, um, you know, since the age of five, eh, right? And that's a little bit cliche. Um, definitely not uh, criticizing anyone else. Um, like, well, I wanna be a better SLP than, um, than my brother had. Uh, that's, that's not good. Um, and then definitely no em embellishing um, or being untruthful. Um, I had a question that came up, again, not a CSD student, but a couple, a couple of days ago, of like, can I put it through rose tinted glasses? No, <laughs> no, you cannot, or no, you probably should not. Um, and then just make sure that you're using spell check. And in addition to using spell check, um, that you're also using the uh, correct word. So even if that word is spelled correctly, it might not be the word that you meant to use. So this is for a cover letter for um, not CSD related at all. Uh, using context clues, they meant to say, I am determined um, to be an asset, uh, but they didn't use the word determined, they used detriment. And that was the exact opposite word <laughs> that they probably meant to use, but unfortunately did. So please use spell check, but please edit it and make sure that it's the correct word. Any uh, last second questions about personal statements? A last second comment I'd like to add. Sure, great. When you have these people check it over, do make sure they are critical. Um, the very common error that happens more often than I'd like is we will see a letter of intent and it will say, it has always been a dream of mine to attend University of Florida. <laughs> All right. Well, good for you. I hope you get in there because now you're not going to get in here. I tell, I can tell that if I'm going to offer you admission and F and UF does too, you're going to go there. So, okay, next in the list. So please, 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 please 
make sure you're, you're addressing the correct institution. Um, it, it's a simple fix. So just make sure you have it. If there's a way not to put the institution in there, that's not necessarily a bad thing because then it reduces the chance that you make that error. But if you do feel very passionately and you do, it is your lifelong dream to attend UF, go ahead and put it in there. But when you apply here to FSU, make sure you take it out or change it to Florida State University, something like that. Hashtag what she said. <laughs> Absolutely what she said. Um, could not agree more. That goes also um, with cover letters when you write cover letters when you're applying to jobs in a couple years. Um, who would you recommend check our personal statements? Um, yeah, so there are two folks in particular. So one is um, general career advising for uh, from the Career Center. So that is available Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Um, so you go to our Career Center website, um, it's the, like the first box that you'll see, and it's general career advising. You are also always welcome to come um, and see me, um, and I'm happy to um, look at your personal statements, resumes, etc. Uh, I did take this week off, so if any of you all have emailed me and I have not responded, um, that is why. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm not great at taking that time off. Um, but I am trying very hard to not look at my emails right now. Um, but I will be back and doing general uh, walk-in advising, uh, drop-in virtual advising next week. So we're going to move on um, to the GRE. So like uh, Ms. Kakel has talked about, um, the GRE has been temporarily waived. Um, but uh, it is a thing. And just because FSU has waived it, that does not mean that all institutions have waived the GRE. Um, or if you're not applying now, but in a couple of years, you know, the GRE might be back on the table. So it's expensive. It's about $160 for every time that you take it. Uh, that adds up real fast. So most students um, only want to take the GRE once, maybe twice. It is on a scale of 120 to 180. Um, it is 120 if you put your name down, if you um, go to take the GRE. Uh, typically, it's on a standard bell curve. The majority of students will score somewhere between 140 and 160. Um, however, each institution has, you know, general um, points that they, they're trying to hit. Uh, for the most part, they're within that bell curve. Um, and your application will likely be looked at in totality. So it is not that if you're not great, great test taker that you should not apply to that institution, right? Because they will also look at your resume. They will also look at your personal statement. They will also read your letters of recommendation. They're also gonna look at your GPA. So that so most institutions will look at your application as a whole, not just the GRE score, <clears throat> but it is a thing. So um, there are preparation courses, there are websites. You know, Kaplan um, has done one um, that's, gosh, several thousand dollars, um, that, that is an option. There's also websites like Magoosh, um, which I think just has a hilarious and fabulous name, um, M-A-G-O-O-S-H, Magoosh. Um, and those are online um, preparation materials that are less expensive than an in-person um, course. If I may go ahead and jump in here. Um, Always. The other thing... I would say is to take as many free practice tests as you can um, to see where your weakness lies and then build from there. Um, if statistically the vast majority of the CSD students score better in verbal than they do quantitative. And so the GRE scores typically are a little bit lower for the, the math section than they are for the verbal section. Um, that's not really uncommon. So if you are at a 150 in verbal and a 150 in math and a four on writing, my recommendation would be to then, if you can retake it, and this goes for anybody who can't afford to retake the test, my, my recommendation is to focus on one particular area and study for that area that you need the most improvement in. If you have a 150 verbal and a 150 quantitative, then your verbal score is actually lower than your math score percentage wise because the math is a little bit harder and the, the, it doesn't correspond equally. So, and since the verbal tends to be more competitive among CSD students, it stands to reason you would probably need to improve that score. So what I would recommend is focusing all on verbal, focus, 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 focus on verbal, and then retaking that. A lot of schools, FSU included, super score. So if you go in and you bomb 
the quantitative score because all you did was focus on the on the verbal. FSU is going to take your best verbal, your best quantitative, your best writing, and that's what we're going to put forward. A lot of schools do super score. If you want to know, email them directly and say, hey, do you super score? But um, if you're if you have any kind of test anxiety, anything like that, that's a strategy that I would recommend so that it makes it a little bit more manageable, particularly if you have a little bit of time or and you have a little bit of extra money. Mm. Absolutely. Um, so we're going to move um, to letters of recommendation. Um, uh, Ms. Kakelis, there's a, um, a question that came through the chat that I think you would be more equipped to answer. Um, let's see. Is FSU going to look at the scores at all if we submit them? That's a fantastic question. I, the answer is I really don't know yet. Um, since we are waiving the GRE this term, uh, the admissions committee has been tasked with reevaluating how we're going to do admissions and what's going to be considered so that everything's fair and equal for all. It's not really fair if you have stellar GRE scores and I don't, and the FSU is waiving the scores. It's not really fair if they look at you and give you bonus points or they say, oh, Jennifer doesn't have them, so she's not going to get considered. So the admissions committee is, is figuring out how they're going to handle that. And unfortunately, at this time, I don't know the, that answer. Um, so letters of recommendation. Um, so letters of recommendation um, for most institutions will absolutely be part of your application uh, package. Um, when you're asking for letters of recommendation, I would very much suggest that you are um, inquiring uh, those folks like four to eight weeks in advance. Um, so if you are applying this fall and you have not asked those folks to, if they would be willing to write you a letter of, of recommendation, today would be the day to do that. <laughs> um, so these are, are folks who are generally going to be um, current or, or uh, former professors of yours um, or people who have been in a supervising setting. So um, again, uh, like Ms. Kakel has talked about, like if you've been in a research position, it might be the person who uh, is over that research lab. It could be a professor that you've connected with, that you enjoy their research, that you've gone to their office hours. Uh, what I would not suggest um, is that it is somebody who you never really talked to before. Um, you did well in their class, you got an A in their class, but that's the pretty much extent of what they know about you. That is likely not the person you want to ask. Um, the people who you do want to ask are, are folks who can speak to your professional and your academic accomplishments, um, the fact that you've been a successful student, the idea that you will continue to be a successful student, that you will graduate um, from a graduate program, that you will do well in that program. Um, so, so ask them in advance. Um, and, uh, and then to follow up with a couple of things. So one is what class you took with them, when you took it, the grade that you received, a copy of your resume, even if it's in a strong working draft, um, but a copy of your resume, a strong working draft of your personal statement. And then what I love and appreciate so much when I'm writing letters of recommendation is three to five bullet points of what you specifically want me to mention. So I don't want you to write, I'm not asking you to write the recommendation letter for me, but I do want um, and appreciate when bullet points are put in of specific things, not I'm a hard worker, I'm a good student, cool, hopefully all of you are, right? Specifically, what are things that you want me to highlight within that letter? Um, and if they say that they wouldn't be a good reference for you, believe them and move on. Don't, don't press. Thank them for, for their time, but don't press. Um, so at this point, I'm going to um, uh, hand it over to Ms. Jennifer Kakelis for any Q&A that you have with her. Hello everyone, me again. Please feel free to ask me any and all questions. Use the chat box, that's probably the easiest. Um, while I'm waiting for questions to come in, and please do submit your questions because realistically we're going to sign off and three of you are going to email me and two of you are going to have the same question. So please don't be embarrassed, don't be shy. Go ahead, ask it. No stupid questions. I've heard most of them. You get bonus points if I haven't heard your question. I'll even tell the admissions committee, they had a, an original question. They stumped me. So fire away. In the meantime, uh, I do want to echo Ms. Heron's uh, sentiments about the letter of intent or the letters of recommendation. 
make sure that you get them, you lined up early. Um, it's now October, the holidays are upon us, winter break, pandemic fatigue, y'all are going through it, they're going through it. So they need a little bit more lead time is, is how I would say it. We're having to make so many adjustments in our curriculum and make decisions so far out, it's panic inducing for everybody involved. So be mindful of the faculty and their time. Uh, along those lines, be sure that you're addressing everybody professionally. That's my little professionalism request. As you see, I'm addressing Ms. Heron as Ms. Heron, and that's professional. That's what you should do. Um, it's going to go a long way. Uh, also, when you are doing your application, make sure that you're not waiting until January 15th to submit your application or the deadline, whatever the deadline may be for the institution. Because in some cases, like FSU, your letter of recommendation authors may not be able to submit their letters until you submit their application. Well, guess what? If you don't submit it and pull the trigger until 9 p.m. on January 15th, you really think they're checking their email at, nine, at 10 o'clock? Mm, probably not. So make sure you're su submitting the application in ample time so that they have time to get their um, letter submitted. If you have anybody have problems, they say, oh, I should have received a notification. I haven't gotten a prompt to submit my letter of recommendation. Contact that institution to see what you can do about getting the prompt redone. Um, SIDCAS uses a, a, a button that you can resend it. FSU does the same thing. So you should be able to get it to them. All right, so let's see. Who should we address the personal statements to? Dear admissions committee, would a recommendation letter from a supervisor not directly in the field be beneficial? Here we go. Hi, Taylor. Um, so this is a good question. It's, it's a very common one. Sorry, you don't get the bonus prize. Um, but what I'm going to say is a letter there's in the academic, in the in graduate admissions, there's a gold standard. Three academic letters of recommendation are the gold standard when it comes to what you can do to get the best letters. Now, those are the ones that are in the field, they're relevant or a related field, doesn't have to be CST, can be any field, but they're able to speak to your academic capability. And since you're looking to continue your academic studies, they want to, our committee wants to know you have what it takes to, to do this. If they get a letter saying, well, Kate was in the top, in the middle 50 percentile of my class, that's not going to be a very strong letter compared to someone who says, Kate was in the top 10% of all of my students of all time. She took initiative X, Y, and Z. Now, if you have a supervisor who is not an academic, but that supervisor is going to be able to say, Kate was a stellar employee. She was one of the best employees I've ever had. Um, I'm reluctantly writing this letter of recommendation because I don't want her to leave me to go to grad school. And that is a far better letter than a mediocre academic one. So what I say is, if you can get three stellar letters of academic reference, that's the gold standard. Past that, two academic, one professional is the next level. All of them stellar. Then you start dropping down a little by little. Um, if you're uh, coming out of an undergraduate program directly and you can't get two or three academic letters of recommendation, that's not gonna be reflect very strongly on you. Particularly if you have a lower GPA, that's gonna make you a less competitive candidate. So three letters of academic reference, so long as they're stellar, gold standard, um, two academic, and one professional, all stellar, next best thing. Just drops a little bit by, from there on. Um, on the FSU grad school application, it says you must have a bachelor's degree before applying to be admitted. You are in the process. So if you're a junior, don't bother applying for fall 2021. If you're a senior, that's right. Just like when you were in high school applying for college, most of you didn't wait to finish high school before you applied for college. You applied while you were in the middle of finishing your high school studies. So what that means is you cannot take our master's program simultaneously as a bachelor student moving on. You have to have a bachelor's degree to be eligible for master's study, but go ahead and apply. We're going to assume that you get the degree before you matriculate. If you don't, your offer of admissions would be rescinded. Do I suggest naming all of the schools you are applying to when asking for letters of recommendation? Yes. The reason being, if you don't, you may not have, um, if you don't list out all of the, and I assume Constance, you're talking about when you send it to a faculty member. Yes, let them know I am applying to 10 schools. Of those 10, eight are on SIDCAS. Of the remaining two, this one uses its own portal and this one only accepts paper applications. 
that lets the faculty member know exactly what they're getting into. Because remember, it's not just one letter of recommendation for you. It's however many schools with however many rules. And then they have it for however many students they do. So again, if you're doing 10 schools and the vast majority of them don't use SIDCAS, and, and statistically, half of them likely would. But if they, that means there's half that don't. So the more schools you have, the different rules, the different systems, they have to create login credentials, they have issues, it might go to their spam filter, it takes a lot of time. So yes, make sure you're listing out all of those schools so that the faculty member can make sure they know what they're getting into. And that way they don't come back to you and say halfway through, I really only have time to do five letters if I'm going to do them all SIDCAS because you didn't tell me you were doing 10. So best to be full, uh, full disclosure there. Um, let's see, I recently graduated from a different master's program and I'm currently a first semester bridge student. Would it be better to get all three recommendations from professors in my previous program or include one from the bridge program, even though this is only my first semester? Erica, if you can get three stellar letters from your previous um, degree, your master's, previous master's, I would recommend that over getting a letter. Uh, and are, Erica, are you applying to our main campus or master's? The reason I ask is if you're applying to the distance learning, um, you're having to ask for those letters now. They're being written and submitted before the end of term. What is Dr. Powell or Dr. Lansford really going to be able to say about you in the first six weeks of class? Um, if you can't get a stellar one from uh, your master's program, please do go ahead and ask Dr. Lansford or Dr. Powell because they will be able to give you a reference that will be indicative of your, of your capability. So sorry about that. That was my toddler banging on the door and giving me a heart attack. So, um, but yes, um, that, that would be my advice to you. These are good questions. So far, nobody's got the bonus point. It, to be fair, though, it's rare that I get a new question. I understand. I, I, I'm sure you're in the same boat. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, so it looks like that those were all the questions in, in the chat. Um, so again, the session has been recorded. I'm, I'm happy to send it to any student. I'm going to put it in the chat window, uh, my email address. It's gonna take a second for um, the video to convert for Zoom, but I'm happy to send it to anyone for reference sake. Uh, we are available by email. Um, I'm available by, by email. I'm sure Ms. Kikilis is too. But otherwise, I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Best of luck with your application materials. Please start early, start now, start today. Um, have critical eyes on all the materials. Um, and otherwise, best of luck. Thank you, Ms. Kakelis, for being here. It's always a pleasure. I really appreciate you. Thank you for having me. Yes. All right. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. And if you have any specific questions uh, or generic questions, please use the email in the chat that I just sent, fsucomdis at cci.fsu.edu. That is a daily monitored box. My inbox gets filled quite uh, quickly this time of year. So you're likely to get a quicker answer if you use the other email. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Hope you have a wonderful day. Bye, all.